Welcome, welcome for the closing session. Uh, my name is Julian Barbier. I'm head of marine policy here at the IOC of UNESCO. And during this session, we are going to review uh, the main messages of a conference uh, and to underline the key challenges for planners that have been identified during this week. We will also uh, highlight the lessons learned, uh, the extremely fruitful exchanges that we've had during those three days. As we said at the beginning of this, uh, of this week, in 2006, when we organized our first workshop on marine spatial planning with, with Charles Eder and a few of, uh, of you who are still in, in the room, and that's, that's very good that you haven't given up, you're still with us and you're still championing the issue. Uh, we were about 40 participants uh, exchanging concepts and ideas on how to better govern ocean space, how to better make use of the resources and to, to manage the human interactions with the marine environment. Today, we have had 300 participants participating in this conference over those last three days. We've engaged, we've interacted, we've shared experience. And I think those who were there in 2006 will agree with me that we are no longer talking about a group of marine managers meeting somewhere in the basement the dark basement of an international organization, we are talking about a healthy and vibrant uh, community of practitioners with a great deal of experience over the last 10 years in terms of MSP implementation and a community with a multitude of expertise working towards a common goal. We are no longer talking about the marine spatial planner, I think. I think we are bringing together experts, scientists, sociologists, lawyers, economists, educators, communicators, data managers, engineers, and even cartoonists and game designer. So we are really talking about assembling skills, about cross-disciplinary expertise from all parts of the world. I just want to show you a few slides about the interaction we've had during this week. If I may ask, please uh, have those on the screen. So we have had 413 active users engaged uh, in this meeting. Of course, participants here, I said there were 300, but of course, outside of the world. Remember that this event has been streamed, uh, streamed uh, over, over the internet. We have had a number of exchanges, and we can monitor that. We had 290 questions asked through the Slido uh, process. Some 1,277 uh, well positively assessed. So what were the most popular questions? We had the, the one on the, the marine spatial planner I just mentioned. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? What is it? I think that's a very interesting question. We had also a question related to capacity development and examples of transboundary MSP. Let's move on. So what were the main topics? We did a, 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 a word cloud here. Marine countries, blue management, process planning, We've had a number of polls, and we'll have another poll during the course of this session. Uh, we had more than 1,144 people voting, and so on. I think that's it. Yes. So, during this, um, as you can see, I think the exchange has been intense over those three days. And in this last session, our goal is really to highlight the main priorities for MSP for the next decade. Where do we want to be? Uh, by 2030. If there is a consensus that it is realistic to triple uh, by 2030 the number of countries that have uh, MSP plans in, in process, how are we going to achieve this? What are the challenges that we need to overcome as a community? How do we integrate those new challenges? Climate change, for example, has been a, a key issue coming up through this uh, week. How do we you know, build resilient management programs? What opportunities do we have? At the opening session, we talked about developing a roadmap for marine spatial planning that can guide the work of both organizations, the European Commission and IOC, in promoting MSP at the international level. And we will, at the end of the session, we'll come back to this, uh, to this plan, but we want to hear first from our reporters uh, from each of the sessions so we can also enrich it with your recommendations as a community. So before we actually go into the, the, the rapporteurs, uh, I also want to remind you that at the beginning of the week we started to play the MSP game challenge on Wednesday. 
So what came out of it? Anybody won? Or did everybody won? Let's uh, hear from uh, Malena and, and Hande, who will give us a, a, a quick overview of uh, what happened during the week. Yes, thank you very much. And what we want to do now is give you just a very brief overview about our MSP challenge experiment we did during the last couple of days. So we, that's Xander Kaiser, um, Lodovac Abspul, who's sitting down there, and I'm Marlena Ripkin. And do you just press here? Yes, and um, what we did we try to develop the weaker C, which is the fictional C, step by step. So we asked every participant to choose one token, which represents an activity or a threat, and place it on the board game um, to see how the weaker C changes over time. So these activities cover pretty much everything from tourism, marine protection, or also um, blue development. So this is what the board game looked like when we started on Wednesday morning. It was fairly undeveloped and um, not really much um, activities going on, but this changed over time. So this is a picture we took today. It was around lunchtime, so you can see it's very developed now. Many tokens have been placed. So there's, there's things going on in the Wicca scene now. Just some very short preliminary results and feedback. So in total, it's even more than 60 participants um, participated in the MSP challenge experiment with over, I think it's now 29 countries where we presented. So people from 29 countries participated with more than 300 years of experience in MSP related topics. And they placed a total of 27 different um, tokens or threats in the WCAC. Um, it was very interesting to see because some have not been um, placed in the WKC, which is, for example, um, blue biotechnology. Um, also, some features have not been discovered yet, so there are some question marks still on the WKC. So it's very interesting to see, so maybe some people were not very curious to see what's underneath it. And um, while also conflicts have been created, so someone put, for example, an oil or gas platform next to um, other places or other tokens, which case um, cause conflicts like marine aquaculture. Or on the other page on the right, um, someone placed a wind farm in front of a beach, so very close to the tourists. Um, while other also um, other features have been combined. So, for example, on the picture on the left, you can see a marine um, heritage site, and another person um, built a token which represents scuba diving. So, just put it on top of it. But this is also the last slide. Um, still, there's very limited transnational cooperation going on, and it has very limited been established. So, most people actually stayed within their national borders. They did not really think about the transnational aspect, but stayed within their national borders. Yes, that's already it. And now Xander is actually going to give some presents to the um, panel here. Some tokens we also placed on, on the board game. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Malena and Chende, and let's give them a, a round of applause. I think uh, this game has really helped us to really put the, 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 the MSP into action and really help us to think a little bit outside of the box. So thank you very much for all your support during this week. So we will now uh, hear from uh, the reports from our sessions, and then we will, of course, have our, our, our panel, and I will introduce uh, the panel after that. So let's start first with uh, what happened in the course of a week, and I will uh, go one by one and uh, ask the reporters to give us, in two minutes, uh, what are the key recommendations, the key actions that we can take forward from your session in uh, supporting MSP implementation in the next decade. So I will start with uh, Anya Kreiner, uh, who will report on the session number three, uh, Lessons Learned from Countries. Anya. 
What we learned from our session, and these are not necessarily in order of priority, is it's very important to develop a vision for MSP for your region, area, or country. An important lesson from the more experienced countries, keep it simple and learn by doing. Don't wait until everything is in place before you start with MSP. Another lesson from a more experienced country, be persistent. MSP is a process, so, so it's going hence and forth. It's not a, a straight line. I think everybody agreed that involving stakeholders from early on in the process is very important. Ensure that you have political support, otherwise you might end up with some um, delays. Reliable data for blue growth is very important. And finally, make sure you institutionalize your MSP. So find a home for your MSP that it goes beyond the project phase, but actually is adopted by government. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, India. So do not wait to have all everything perfect before you start MSP. And make sure you institutionalize it. Those are very important points. Let's move on to session number four on stakeholder engagement. And uh, I'll give the floor to Jacek Zaucha. Thank you very much. So, uh, first uh, observation. It was a really great conference. Can you imagine that we discussed the report from our session during uh, night, two o'clock, three o'clock I received. So, this shows you engagement. Okay, and now key lessons learned. So, the first one is uh, in line with our cloud which means process, process, and process. So uh, engagement of stakeholder needs a process with rules, leadership, fuel, which is information, and proper timing. That's very important. So timing, starting from the very beginning. If you start process, start your uh, engagement. Now, what are the indicators of success? First is building understanding. That stakeholders understand each other. Th that's very, very important. And then, what should be the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal should be ownership, ownership of your planning. If you reach it, that was a great, great engagement process. And now there is one big dilemma, which I want to, to finish, with which, with which I want to finish my statement. So the dilemma is that uh, you must face a balance between engaging everybody and achieving your uh, planning result. And for that, you must try to decouple planning process from, uh, from stakeholder engagement. So stakeholder engagement should be continuous, not attached to concrete planning situation. And for that, you should be also neutral. So you should not be instrumental. You should not push stakeholders telling that we must have a result. No, we must have understanding. But to solve this dilemma, stakeholder process should be continuous. Thank you. Thank you very much. So keep the ownership, very important, and maintain the stakeholder process throughout uh, the, 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 the implementation decoupled from the planning process. Very uh, key messages here. Um, let's move on to session number five, which is on MSP and uh, its role in global ocean governance. And I asked Alejandro Iglesias to report. Thank you, Julian. Uh, the panelists in session five, uh, efficiently moderated by Ms. Ida Rutherdvar, was composed by representative by, of IOC UNESCO, the European Commission, Digimare, UN Environment, and CBD. MSP will definitely play an important role for the implementation of Agenda 2030 because they, there is already extensive experience in terms of the capacity development and cooperation to develop further on national, regional, and global level. The importance of partnership was a key topic discussed and collaboration for international ocean governance, which is key as well for the very important and upcoming events this year in New York and Malta, to help countries and all parties involved to implement the Agenda 2030 at national and regional level, including, of course, cross-border cooperation and in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Let me finish with uh, Lisa Benson's word, collaboration, Collaboration, collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. Collaboration and keeping uh, uh, in line with the Agenda 2030, translating those global goals at the MSP level. What does it actually mean? Very important. Uh, moving on to session number seven uh, on uh, uh, good practice for science-based uh, marine spatial planning. Uh, I'll give the floor to Ingela Isaacson. Thank you. Uh, I got six key messages from our session. Better and marine spatial plan is sub 
optimal state than one that comes too late. For the second one, socioeconomics matters are important, so think about them throughout the whole MSP process. Cumulative effects assessment should have a clearly defined purpose based on understanding of the social, economic, environmental drivers and consequences of the policies described in the Marine Spatial Plan. Climate change is a major driver of condition and trend for marine systems and must be a central consideration for marine spatial planning uh, efforts. And then as a fifth one, collaborations makes a difference. It takes time, but it's worth it. And then at last but not the least, listen to your geese heart or groove is in the geese heart. I'm not going to sing that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Angela. So yes, yeah, very, very pertinent recommendation as well. Role of climate, of course, we mentioned this. And you probably think that people in UNESCO don't know how to count because I went from uh, from six to uh, no, from five to, to seven, and I missed uh, session number six. So I just want to give a floor now to to Damon Stanwell Smith uh, to to tell us the outcome of session on uh, cross border cooperation. Damon. Thank you very much. Um, so we, um, from our study on cross-border MSP, the first point was that uh, we concluded that good practices rather than best practice, as one size does not fit all, that and cross-border was defined as cross-jurisdictional for the purpose of that study. Um, from our global inventory, we found that most co cross-border cooperation occurs at a subnational level. From our case studies on cooperation, we found that um, the key purpose um, is to build a constituency of individuals or leaders committed to um, progress MSP process forward. On the ecosystem approach, we concluded it's um, very difficult to implement in practice um, in rapidly changing environments, so focus on making ecosystem-based decisions despite the unknowns. On implementation, um, MSP is found to be more successful and based on formal as well as informal situations as it strengthens commitment and trust between them. On monitoring and evaluation, an easy to understand and relevant m and &E system with simple indicators helps build a common identity. However, complex m and &E risks long-term failure. When on good practice, our overarching lesson is that MSP is a social and political process more so than a technical challenge. The six good practices that um, we have distilled out from the work we've done over the last year. Number one is that designs that build trust and common purpose do work. To invest in understanding an existing governance systems, to adopt an issue-driven approach, to adopt a long-term perspective, to manage expectations for stakeholder involvement, that adaptive MSP requires effective long-term monitoring and evaluation. And if there's one take-home word that we felt really came from all the case studies was that uh, to engender trust underpins successful cross-border MSP. Building trust, very important. I will not sum up your, your main points. We are too many, but it's a very, very rich uh, session, clearly. Um, let's uh, move on to session number eight on Blue Growth, and I'll give the floor to Marie Colombier from DJ Marie. Thank you, Julian. There are three messages that we would like you to bring back today on this session on Blue Growth and Maritime Special Planning. The first one is that the maritime economy offers a great potential. In China, it contributes to 10% of the GDP. However, as you have pointed out this morning, there is a risk that MSP for blue growth becomes like playing monopoly for the seas. And that's why our Swedish speaker highlighted the need for a comprehensive stakeholder process to avoid this situation. The second message is that all maritime sectors are subject to a multiplicity of rules and legislation. Maritime special planning offers a process to combine the respect of these rules and the coherent development of these sectors. While multiple use is currently studied and unavoidable for the future, still more needs to be done for it to be commercially viable. And finally, the third point is, was on the definition of blue growth, or should I call it sustainable maritime economy with many ocean colors. As the aquaculture speaker mentioned, environment is not just another sector to put on the map, but should be seen as the basis for everything. And the closing word by Bernard Fries, the facilitator, is the following. It's the need for us to remain humble when seeking growth in the marine environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, marine environment ecosystem as a foundation for blue growth. That's essential. Uh, moving on to session number nine um, on capacity development, I will now give the floor to Angela Schulze-Zidden. Angela. Okay, now you can hear me. 
Okay, the messages from the institutional capacity building uh, session are the following, echoing what has already been mentioned by the other rapporteurs. Uh, first of all, all presentations of across all countries and regions of the world showed that there is for sure no lack of institutions. In fact, there is a plethora of institutions, but that there is therefore a really strong need for a strong coordinating body which takes on board maritime spatial planning. And in this highlighting that, you know, thinking about, you know, the key question here which also came up, but what are the key competences of a maritime spatial planner or a maritime spatial planning team? Well, not to be a bird, but in fact that the key um, the, the key competence really needed is strong facilitation, strong coordination competences, and that this is actually lacking currently in training, that social aspects, management aspects should be taken on board. And the second key competence a maritime spatial planner or a team should have is to be visionary and to actually sort of really pursue this in the long term. Another message is that, that for sure there is a need for more MSP training, uh, also in Europe even, but not only on the master program level, but that there is a strong need for training diversification and continuous professional development, and that this should sort of take various formats for professionals being at webinars, targeted workshops, and sort of, you know, to have a continuous effort like these events, but to sort of break them down into sort of more targeted um, chunks, in a sense. So that really there is something to build on in terms of the knowledge sharing platforms. Uh, another message is that MSP is about a long-term process, so therefore there is also a need for long-term funding, not only for MSP training worldwide, but that since training is about learning by doing, that this has to be obviously also complemented by funding for MSP implementation. So guidelines and guidebooks are good, but actually sort of provide the funding to make it happen. And that was really the key messages. And I think, Thank yes. you very much, great. So we really need to address those training needs for MSP and we need to uh, improve uh, skills in facilitation and, and cooperation uh, across the board. Um, and then our last uh, reporter, that's David Johnson, who will uh, uh, tell us what happened just earlier uh, this afternoon on the uh, ABNJ uh, session, David. Thank you, Julian. Yes, just very fresh in your minds, I hope. Uh, I think uh, what I was going to start with was that there's no real MSP in ABNJ as yet, but my panel were much more positive and forward-looking than that, and they uh, were recognizing tentative shoots and the need at the outset for strategic planning rather than any sort of retrofit. Um, we highlighted the exciting uh, negotiations towards a, a legal implementing agreement for biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, and then regional interests that uh, can move this towards implementation with, with uh, evidence of, of political will. I think all the, the panelists also emphasize the potential for projects in areas beyond national jurisdiction to both understand trade-offs and to help build institutional capacity. And then final messages I felt were that uh, whilst this is a long-term process, there's an urgency to start to think about this for area beyond national jurisdiction. There is an imperative to make sure that there's full cost accounting and an ecosystem-based approach is, is taken, and that might include uh, using uh, ecologically or biologically significant areas and also vulnerable marine ecosystems as a network and as a, as a foundation uh, upon which you can identify special areas of, of uh, biological interest, but then adding to that uh, areas of of human and cultural interest and, and activity. Above all, I think for ABNJ, one of the messages is that this is uh, about equity as well, both intra-societal and intergenerational, and therefore ABNJ, Marine Spatial Planning, should all be about benefit sharing uh, as well as um, uh, taking uh, from, the, from the ocean. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, David. Of course, uh, yes, benefit sharing is at the heart of a very ongoing negotiation in New York for this new legal agreement, as well as area-based management tools. So I think there is a, a real opportunity for for moving the, the uh, forward with potential experimentation with MSP and ABNJ. Okay, I, I really want to thank you guys. This is a great job. Please a round of applause for our reporters. We've done an excellent job. Thank you. And then we move to the panel. Uh, we have the chance of having with us uh, five eminent uh, experts and, and, and practitioners in, in MSP. And uh, we will go uh, one by one and I'm going to ask them to react to the, the, what they've heard uh, just now from the reporters and tell us a little bit more about what they think uh, should be the priority in the next decade in terms of uh, MSP implementation. And to start with, I will uh, give the floor to Monsieur Vincent Bouvier, who started his professional career uh, in the National Agency for Development of Research. And Mr. Bouvier has held several high-level functions in the French civil service as head of cabinet and prefect and high commissioner for New Caledonia. And since 2016, he acts as the secretary general of the C, uh, which is uh, sitting within the prime minister uh, office in France. So Mr. Bouvier, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. Je voudrais d'abord vous, vous remercier de m'avoir invité et de me donner l'occasion de m'exprimer devant vous et puis vous féliciter aussi de l'organisation de cette conférence. Je suis frappé à la fois de la densité, de l'importance et de la densité des thèmes évoqués et aussi bien sûr de l'importance et de la qualité de l'ensemble des participants et des intervenants. Je voudrais pour tenter de répondre à votre question exprimer deux convictions qui me, ne me paraissent pas contradictoires avec, celles que, avec les, les restitutions que nous avons entendues. Première conviction de fond, ce qui caractérise aujourd'hui la mer et l'espace maritime, c'est la multiplication des, des usages, d'usages souvent conflictuels. Ce qui caractérise l'espace maritime, c'est donc le conflit des usages et les tensions entre les différents usagers de la mer. La planification spéciale, je, spatiale, pardon, je commencerai par là, c'est la façon de gérer et de répondre à ces conflits d'usage. La planification, c'est une condition, la planification spéciale, spatiale pardon, maritime, c'est une condition du développement. Mais quand je dis développement, je ne prends pas développement au sens strict, je, par, je parle d'un développement équilibré, on dit parfois croissance bleue, c'est-à-dire de la bonne conciliation entre la protection de l'environnement et le développement économique ou le développement de l'activité. Et dans cet exercice de planification spatiale, toujours comme conviction de fond, je crois que les pouvoirs publics, et notamment les États, ont un rôle majeur à jouer au service de l'intérêt général et pour la construction de ce que on peut appeler une politique maritime intégrée, c'est-à-dire la conciliation entre les différentes politiques maritimes sectorielles, que ce soit l'énergie, l'environnement, la protection de l'environnement, mais aussi la politique de défense. Après la conviction de fond, deux de convictions de méthode. Quelle est, et quand j'exprime ces convictions, je reflète aussi bien sûr la position du gouvernement que je représente, quelles sont les deux précautions de méthode qu'il faut prendre dans la construction de la planification spatiale Il y a une première précaution de méthode, c'est qu'on ne peut pas construire cela de façon isolée. Il faut associer étroitement toutes les parties prenantes. La, la planification spatiale maritime doit nécessairement se construire de façon concertée avec l'ensemble des acteurs. C'est ce que nous essayons de faire en France avec le, la création de conseils maritimes de façade dans les différentes façades maritimes et la construction de documents stratégiques de façade. Documents stratégiques de façade qui vont s'appuyer sur deux séries d'orientations, des orientations européennes avec la directive stratégie pour le milieu marin et la directive sur la planification de l'espace maritime et une orientation générale nationale qui découle de ce chapeau européen qui est la stratégie nationale pour la mer et le littoral qui a été adoptée récemment. Et dans, ce, dans cette construction générale, nous disposons d'un certain nombre d'outils sectoriels, si je puis dire, un seul exemple pour ne pas être trop long en matière de politique de transition énergétique nous essayons de bâtir progressivement une définition de zone de vocation qui serait susceptible d'accueillir de l'éolien. Donc première conviction de méthode, ça ne peut être qu'une construction concertée. 
Deuxième conviction de, de méthode, cette fois, la planification spatiale doit, être, doit trouver le, le, la bonne échelle géographique, doit s'adapter à la bonne échelle géographique. Je veux dire par là que l'échelle de la planification doit être adaptée à l'échelle des activités. Elle sera nécessairement plus fine dans une rade ou aux abords des ports que dans la partie la plus large de la zone économique exclusive. Les problèmes se posent de façon différente dans une mer confinée, très fréquentée. Je pense par exemple à, à, à la Manche, à la Manche mer du Nord, ou au contraire dans une partie beaucoup plus ouverte sur l'océan. Et j'en profite pour dire ici que notre façon de faire a été non pas de se limiter à la France hexagonale ou à la France métropolitaine, mais d'étendre, au-delà d'ailleurs de ce que nous demandait l'Europe, d'étendre l'exercice de planification à l'ensemble des Outre-mer français, puisque vous savez que si la France a la deuxième zone économique exclusive, c'est à 95% grâce à nos Outre-mer. Et quand je dis s'adapter à l'échelle géographique, je veux dire aussi que cette échelle géographique doit dépasser les limites et les frontières entre les États. C'est évident ce que je vais vous dire. Il serait absurde de prévoir dans une zone économique exclusive une zone de protection des oiseaux, par exemple, ou des espèces rares, et d'accepter que dans l'État d'à côté, dans la zone économique immédiatement voisine, nous ayons, par exemple, une zone de développement de l'éolien. Donc on ne peut pas travailler. Les États ne peuvent pas travailler seuls. Ils doivent travailler avec les acteurs, mais ils doivent travailler avec leurs voisins. C'est ce, ce qui se construit au niveau européen avec la politique maritime intégrée au niveau européen, avec plusieurs grands espaces, plusieurs grands bassins où doit s'appliquer concrètement cette politique maritime intégrée, la Baltique, la Méditerranée, l'Atlantique. Mais c'est aussi ce, qu faut, ce à quoi ils font songer dans un cadre international. On, on doit ré réfléchir à une planification transfrontalière, ce qui n'est pas toujours un exercice facile, c'est un exercice qui doit impliquer au-delà des spécialistes, des généralistes, ce que sont les diplomates. Et c'est un exercice qui peut s'inscrire dans un cadre général où, les, où existent ou peuvent exister encore des conflits sur les délimitations des mers territoriales ou des conflits sur les délimitations des zones économiques exclusives, conflits qui, à notre sens, doivent se résoudre prioritairement par la discussion et par la négociation. Et comme, comme j'ai déjà été trop long, je m'arrête là. Merci à vous. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Bouvier. So the take-home points is, is we need strategic planification, and, and here in France, built on the, of course, on the European Commission, EU directives, as well as as, as your own national strategic uh, uh, orientation. We need to work at the right scale and adapt the MSP uh, to the activities that we are trying to regulate and manage. And we need transnational uh, cooperation to address the challenges and the conflicts. Great. Thank you very much. We'll move on to, to our next panelist. And of course, after the end, we're going to have a, a session of, of questions, including with, with the audience. So my next panelist is, of course, uh, Lisa Svensson, uh, who is the director and coordinator of Marine and Ecosystem Branch at uh, UN Environment and uh, formerly uh, with the Swedish Diplomatic Service as Ambassador for the Ocean and Freshwater and has been very much involved with uh, pushing for an Ocean SDG in 2030. So now, Elisa, what is your, your priorities and where do you think we need to go in the next uh, 10 years in marine spatial planning? Thanks, Julian. Um, I have a few comments and I'm hopefully responding to your questions, but the first one is Marine Special Planning needs to be a practical tool and it needs to be very explicit and parts of that is the database, the statistics, so very practical things. At the same time, we should not forget why we do it, asking ourselves the question, so what? So the Marine Special Planning is not in gold in itself and I think sometimes when we are at those conferences and we talk to expertise, we also have to realize that we are trying to achieve something with this whole plan, so this is really not the end of it. My second point is that we need to bring in the social scientist and the linkages to human behavior and co or co coordinate this with the natural scientist. So social and natural scientists is, is crucial. The third point is the interconnection, interconnection between the cross sectors, uh, but also the land and sea, seeing what's needed on land and how that connected to sea. And the third point is the private sector 
in this interconnectivity. We sometimes forget the private sector, and the private sector is a dynamic force that comes up with those creative ideas that we bureaucrats sometimes cannot um, come up with in our institutions. And the interconnectivity is also needed within regions, but also between regions, and I think we should not forget the stronger collaboration, as was mentioned before. My fourth point is we need to have, or we need to keep, a holistic perspective when we do the plans. And I think it was mentioned by Dixon from the Nairobi Convention, that if we see ocean as actually a solution to reach the other goals, we can also see a tremendous benefit and an integrated perspective on the whole Agenda 230. And just to mention a few of them, and I think we heard them during the course of the days, poverty reduction, food energy, uh, food security and energy security is just issues that needs to be addressed only by working from a sustainable approach to use the ocean or marine resources. My last point is one size does not fit all. Once we talk about marine spatial planning, we have to realize that the world looks very differently. If you are in Africa, if you are in Northern Europe, or if you are in America, the world is very differently. And so it's also individuals. And this is, of course, a challenge, but it's also a tremendous opportunity. So we need to know where are we in this particular region or in this area based? Where is our core case? And I think I was brought up when I made my remarks that we need to start with this mapping. What do we have? And some regions already know that. They have come well in advance. And then the assessment and evaluation, and that could be economic nature, social culture, but we are in a different stages in life. And we need, at the same time, recognize this the differences, we also need to learn on how to collaborate between them and also accepting that we are different and accepting that the learning practical institution and tool is crucial. And just as a reminder, then the capacity building to learn but also to share best practice, and we do have 18 regional seas and we are from the United Nations environment working on how to strengthen and strengthen the collaboration between those and also obviously within them. So my last point would be the ocean governance is really marine spatial planning on a regional basis. Great, thank you very much, Lisa. So the, the, your main points is basically remember that MSP, we need to make sure we keep the objectives in mind. It's a, it's a tool to achieve an objective. We need stronger social uh, scientist inclusion. We need collaboration at the regional level. We need a, a, to link MSP with other SDGs, energy, food security, poverty, education. We need to contextualize MSP. I think it's very important to the, to the culture, to the socioeconomic uh, conditions in the regions. And of course, the point on capacity development, uh, including working through the regional seas uh, to develop this capacity uh, within the regions and across regions. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move on to our third speaker. And you already heard Bernard uh, earlier this morning, but uh, I will re reintroduce him. Uh, Bernard is, Fris is the director of a uh, DG Mare. He has been since uh, uh, 2017 in charge of marine policy and the blue economy. And now Bernard, please tell us, what is your priority areas for the next decade? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Julian. And, uh, as, as you go down the row of speakers, it's getting more and more difficult just not to say I agree with what my, <laughs> my previous speakers have, have been saying. If, if, if I can try to, to, to bring it to, to one point, then I think my one single uh, conclusion would be that we need to keep the momentum going. I have sensed, sensed such a uh, richness of ideas and, and contributions and of achievements actually in, in the room today uh, and you throughout the conference that you know, it's almost impossible to summarize and to say this is more important than the other. Each of these points are important and we need to develop them and we need to develop, keep going to do it in a, in a positive momentum and I think this event has clearly shown that, uh, that we have that momentum and we have it in a way that um, we didn't have it 10 years ago when this process started. We are halfway towards uh, the 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Goal, um, and probably we should not aim for 2030, but for something sooner than that, uh, to really have a, a functioning maritime marine spatial planning uh, system in, in most of the, of the sea regions of, 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 of the globe. Um, what I sense is that many nations and many countries are still 
discovering, starting to develop the maritime economy. Some have advanced very much, others are advancing as we speak. Um, so that is, if you look at the broad picture, the economic picture, it is, it is a situation of a big opportunity. Uh, it's a situation of a big responsibility. Um, we have made many mistakes in, in our land-based economies, and, and, and many of our rivers are polluted, and, and you know, we, are, we are trying to recuperate, and, and in some areas we are good at recuperating these, these mistakes. We have made some mistakes in the oceans, but we still can avoid many of the errors that we have made in our economic development until now. If we take a rational and ecosystem-based approach, uh, if we act uh, with, with, with the involvement of all the interests, if we act in a systematic way, if we think before we do things, I think that's the essence of, 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 of MSP. Um, and, and really, I think all the, all the points that are made today somehow can contribute to that. Uh, the last session on the, on the areas beyond national jurisdiction, I think, was particularly interesting and instructive because it, it exemplified the kind of challenges we face. So I, I would say the one thing I would recommend doing, and I think we'll, we'll get there, is to keep the momentum going. Great. Thank you very much, Bernard. So keep the momentum going. I think that you've given some, some orientations that we can follow, and we will continue to discuss those in, in, in future. Uh, my next speaker is uh, Ashali Amukuaya. Uh, Ashali is well known to IOC. He is the Executive Secretary of Benguela Current Convention, the BCC, based in Namibia and Swakopmund. And the BCC is the first uh, intergovernmental multi sectoral uh, convention in the world to be based on a large marine ecosystem uh, approach to, to ocean governance. So let me give the floor to Ashley. Please, Ashley, tell us what is, what is your priority and how can we get there uh, in, in the next 15 years? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, when um, Charles, uh, Charles Ella uh, made uh, his projection on, on day one, you know, I, I had no hesitation actually to agree with his projection because um, uh, based on our experience, um, it's the first commission or convention um, that's based on the large marine ecosystem concept, and it's a multi-sectorial uh, 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 convention. Uh, we believe strongly that um, uh, these um, LMEs or commissions all around the world, and in particular, we, you know, Africa is covered by these uh, LME commissions or projects, these are excellent platforms uh, that, uh, if they are utilized, like uh, in our case, what we have started in the Benguera uh, current convention area, if they are utilized to start up these uh, MSP processes, they can be an excellent, they can be excellent uh, uh, building block such that uh, 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 we can achieve in, in, in uh, this um, coverage at, at global level uh, as projected by, by, by Charles Ella. So that momentum can, uh, I, I think, these um, um, arrangements or structures that are already existing in various parts of the world can uh, better utilize uh, to achieve that. Of course, um, there's uh, a need for uh, collaboration at, at regional and at global level, need to support. Uh, especially developing countries in terms of funding, sharing experience, and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, but I think uh, that um, uh, can be achieved. There has been a lot of emphasis almost uh, by all the rapporteurs in terms of the importance of uh, stakeholders' uh, engagement, and uh, that's critical. I, I, uh, some of the experience we have uh, and some that were presented also indicates that um, uh, sometimes stakeholders, uh, well, non-governmental stakeholders are engaged a little bit further down after, almost sometimes even after the uh, 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 plan has been, uh, has been mm -hmm. completed, and I think that's too late. Um, uh, and I think the example of Mexico, for instance, uh, they uh, start much earlier on in, uh, bringing in the private uh, private sectors, public sector, everyone with stake in, in, in the plan. And I think uh, that um, would be the, the best way uh, to go. 
Thank you very much, Ashley. So LMEs, yes, this is something we haven't maybe talked enough about, but uh, those, those large marine ecosystem projects provide interesting mechanisms in terms of developing transboundary governance at the regional level. And all of those are going through the adoption of a common strategic action plan. So the question is really how can MSP be used as a tool to, to help those countries to achieve those strategic action uh, together? So that's, that's very interesting. Um, and then finally, uh, but not least, uh, our last panelist is uh, Ida. And let me get your bio so I don't say something silly. Uh, so, Ida Rutervaut, who uh, has been with us already uh, on, 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 the pod, on the panel here, he is a policy officer with the Natural Environment Division of the Swedish Ministry of Environment and Energy. And of course, Ida has been actively engaged in the uh, preparation and organization of the uh, UN conference on SDG 14 taking place in June. So, Ida, what are your priorities and where do you think we need to go from here? Okay, thank you. Um... Well, firstly, I think the days we have passed now, it has been a major team building event. Um, where we are, where we're going, getting together as a group. And uh, picking up on what we say, we're, we're on a journey together. And uh, we keep, need to keep the momentum going. And a big thank you to the organizers of this event to, to bring us on this journey ahead. Um, in Sweden, we have the expression of saying, we meet the spring in Paris. So, um, we, perhaps we can see that we are now meeting the spring of MSP in Paris. It has been growing under the surface, and we see now the green coming up. And uh, we see projections for the future, as Mr. Ehlert presented the first day, um, that 2015, 16 countries were developing marine spatial planning, and for 2030, 80 countries. 10% uh, of the E said in 2015, 50% in 2030. My point here is looking at 2030, of course, because, uh, uh, and I want to highlight two things. The policy journey we're going to make the coming years, and the visual journey I think we're going to make, visualization of what we're doing. Um, the policy journey, as has been addressed by many here, um, putting Agenda 2030 as really the political agreed vision, uh, global vision. I mean, it's, it's basically the only um, such an um, integrated and uh, comprehensive uh, agreement um, where we're going together. And I think for marine spatial planning, this is crucial because not only the Agenda 2030 can help us to set the vision when we're planning on each and every level, that's something that countries have agreed upon, and, and when we work on the coastal level, national level, uh, EU level, uh, and global level, we have those agreed targets. And we know that's kind of, a, a, as uh, Lisa Emilia Svensson mentioned, that's the objective, uh, what we see at the horizon. Of course, that's, that's very generic in general, but we can break it down into our concrete work. And I hope that we will see a lot of this concrete building stones, using one of your, your words just mentioned. When we go, when we work on the national plans on the Agenda 2030, let us see how marine spatial planning can be become an important uh, part of that. Not only as a, if we put it in the national plan of, of Agenda 2030, it could be a help to really push for legislation on MSP perhaps. But it could also be that we show by, um, by showing MSP in the context of Agenda 2030 how we can, can um, find the objective of how we can show MSP as a means to move towards the agenda. So uh, I, I would really recommend and, and look forward to see the variety of ideas how to put, bind together MSP uh, on the national level. 
and of course on the global level, um, be working for the Swedish government, uh, preparing for the UN conference in June on Agenda 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Goal 14. I hope that there will be a recognition in June for marine spatial planning and area-based management really as an important, uh, important means for the work forward. So um, please follow the work ahead uh, coming up to the June meeting. The second journey and, and kind of my recommendation or, or uh, thought after these days is really where we're going with our minds. I mean, what's unique with us humans is our imagination, our, our creativity and our, our ability to make plans and planning. And if we look 10 years back, I mean, where were we when it was, when we were sketching maps or, or uh, uh, putting information together? Well, we, we walked a long road those 10 years, not only with Slido and those kind of devices, but where will we be in 10 years? I think there will be a huge development, and I hope that we all can contribute in this regard, making a visual journey on marine spatial planning. We have heard all the information we are gathering, really to engage participation and decision-making in this visual journey of, of, uh, that, we are, that we are doing. Uh, to finalize, I want to mention that I, I've been working at the Ministry for uh, for quite many years, and I, I was in the meeting where, when our minister saw the cartoons made by WWF, and he realized, seeing these cartoons, that we need spatial planning. So that was really affected with the cartoons. But in a few years, we will have on our government table uh, the plans for decision. And that's going to be a challenge also for decision making to grasp what's in these plans. What will, will it be for, for us to take decisions about? So the visual, visual perspective of marine spatial planning, I think, will be an important part of our journey ahead. Thank you. Great, Ida. Thank you very much. So two, two very broad recommendation on the policy level. Let's make sure that we align MSP with the national SDG priorities and we we use MSP to gain political supports um, that there is at the SDG level then to translate that in, in, in implementation. And I think we also need to, to build the knowledge base and we need to show good examples of benefits of MSP and how it's, it can really uh, uh, um, you know, support the, the SDG objectives. So we need to, to, to come up with studies and, 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 and good, good uh, I mean, practices around those uh, ideas. And of course the issue of communication, we need to, to have strong communication tools uh, to reach out to decision makers, but also to citizens as, as a whole. I mean, I think everybody li likes a map. Uh, that's what I've, I've seen in, in when you show a map, people usually, uh, for the wrong or the, the good reasons, uh, tend to focus on it and look at the boundaries and so on. So I think we, we have, through marine spatial planning, a capacity to, to really show how this interaction is operating in, in, a, in a free dimension space. And, and I think we need to really invest in, in, in doing this. So I think that's, uh, that's great. Now we have uh, about um, 20 minutes, I think, to, to have a little bit of uh, questions and uh, interactions. And uh, let's uh, go around the room. And if you could also tell us what you think, if we have missed some uh, priorities or there are things that you want to highlight or to react in terms of uh, the panelists, can we please have a, a couple of interventions? And we will also put up a slide to see what's coming up there. Uh, we can pick up some of those questions. But let's start with the room. Yes, Adopte Blivy, please. Je voudrais ici saluer l'Union Européenne et la Commission Océanographique Intergouvernementale de maintenir le rythme. Et pendant ces trois jours, j'ai compris que euh, la mer, les océans et les côtes deviennent le moteur catalyseur du prochain monde. En face de cela, des questions subsistent. Tout le travail que vous avez fait, je pense aux cinq orateurs de tout à l'heure, nous résume la situation. Monsieur Bouvier, vous laissez une question fondamentale. La question sur la politique de défense. Peut-être Julien va vous donner deux minutes pour que vous nous éclatez ce que vous entendez par politique de défense. 
Je suis auditeur libre d'intelligence stratégique à l'IEP de Rennes. Et cette question est fondamentale aujourd'hui, puisque les nouvelles menaces sont des menaces technologiques. Et on ne voit pas dans tous ces discours, présentations suivies ces trois jours, personne n'a parlé de menaces des prochaines installations de Marine Spatial Planning. Merci. Qu'est-ce que vous intégrez dans politique de défense Thank you very much, Professor Blivy. We'll take another couple of questions and then we'll go back to the panel. Um, anybody else would like to, to raise a point, ask a questions? If not, we'll uh, look at the... Yes, gentleman there at the back. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Jochen Lam, WWF. Well, if, if we might raise some, some wishes for what should happen in 10 years ahead, I think we would like to see truly ecosystem-based planning on coastal EEZ and areas be beyond national jurisdiction level, also including all the sectors, including fisheries and, uh, for example, deep sea mining as, a, as one, uh, as, as two sectors explicitly. And I hope that in, in a 10 years' time, we also would expect that we are also able to define the spatial targets for the sector development and the carrying capacity for the sea basins so that we, when we saw what, what will happen when we have an, an, an annual growth of 10%, we are in 10 years by 100% growth and I think we will have to define the, the ecological boundaries that we can live in by that time and maybe we will be able to do that in 10 years. Great, thank you very much. Those are very good points. I don't think it's a question, but I think we can, we can take that on board in our, in our recommendations. Any additional question? Yes, another gentleman at the back. Yes, Paul, please. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, Paul Gilliland, I work on marine planning in England. And firstly, thank you to everyone involved in organizing this conference. I've been working on marine planning for quite a while, but there's still much to learn, and I have a lot to take away from this conference. Um, one of the benefits of coming to these meetings is that you discover, oh yes, other people are wrestling with the same problems that we are. And there's one that's cropped up quite a lot in this conference, which is we've talked about improving integration, but yet many countries are struggling with how do we achieve appropriate integration between fisheries and marine spatial planning. And I wonder if anyone on the panel can give a reflection on what one thing they would do to, to help tackle or address that challenge. Thank you. Great, thank you. We, we take one last question and then we go back to the panel. Antonio Diaz de Leon, please. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Uh, I've been practicing marine spatial planning for the last 20 years. And uh, I've seen that uh, most of, uh, of the most reputed NGOs in the world have been quite reluctant to go into this direction, to be honest. They have been engaged with marine protected areas as the, as the holy grail of marine conservation, which I do not believe is the case. Suddenly, and I'm glad the WWF, the Nature Conservancy, are looking for this approaches as a useful approach, as another approach to increase at least governance in the regions. Can you make a reflection if, if it's only my perception or, you, or if you share the same kind of a perception, if it doesn't make, put you in the trouble, please. Okay, thank you very much for those uh a very interesting question. So maybe let's try to address the first one on, on maritime security. Can I maybe ask uh, Secretary General if, if you have any, any thoughts on this idea? Merci beaucoup. Je, je vais vous répondre peut-être. Ma réponse va-t-elle vous sembler un peu brutale? Le monde de la mer n'est pas un monde paisible. Le monde de la mer est un monde difficile traversé de tensions. Tous les États doivent faire face à de nombreux défis. Le défi économique, nous savons que la mer recèle de nombreuses richesses. Mais nous savons aussi aujourd'hui qu'il y a une très forte compétitivité entre les États pour défendre ces richesses. 
Nous savons aussi que le contexte géostratégique se transforme profondément et qu'à côté des grandes puissances maritimes traditionnelles, on voit émerger de nouvelles puissances maritimes avec leurs revendications, y compris leurs revendications territoriales. Je ne prends pas parti ici sur la légitimité de telle ou telle revendication. Je dis que c'est un fait. Autre menace, le développement du terrorisme, le développement de la piraterie, la gestion des flux migratoires, la, la nécessité de protection de l'environnement. Tout ça constitue des défis, des enjeux et parfois des menaces. Quand je dis politique de défense, je dis tout simplement, c'est une évidence, il ne faut pas la nier, que les États souverains veulent défendre leurs intérêts dans ce vaste conflit. Et pour être très concret, en matière de planification spatiale, ça veut dire quoi Ça veut dire qu'un État souverain doit légitimement préserver la présence à la mer de sa marine nationale, que ce soit dans la mer territoriale, que ce soit dans la zone économique exclusive ou que ce soit dans la haute mer. Et que lorsqu'on travaille sur un usage précis d'un bassin maritime, on se heurte très concrètement à la conciliation des besoins de la marine nationale et puis à la nécessité de protéger l'environnement, à la nécessité de développer les énergies marines renouvelables, à la nécessité de pêcher, etc. Donc c'est ça, la politique. C'est en cela que la politique de défense, qui, qui, re, qui appartient à, aux États souverains, interfère dans l'exercice de planification spatiale maritime. Je crois avoir été clair. Oui, merci, merci beaucoup. Uh, there was a question on, on, on integration of fisheries sectors in the um, in the MSP process. Either Bernard or, or Ashley, has, can you give some thoughts on this? Okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. Thank you. Very good and very interesting question. Um, I, I'd like to perhaps make two, two points in, in, in response. First of all, and, and that's, that's been part of my job for a few years now, man, management of, of fisheries, I think we, we are probably well advised to take an economic approach just as much as a, um, a, a sustainability approach. In other words, the key challenge we still have in, in, in European waters is, is basically to exploit our fish stocks in a sustainable manner, to keep them at a, at a sustainable level. It's, it's still the main challenge. And, and if, if and when we meet that challenge, um, we will have done a, a, great, a great thing for the economic welfare and the, the profitability of our fishing industry. And, you know, all the economic data we have show that as we move towards more sustainability, the economic performance improves year by year and by year. And it, it's, it's very clear that there's a correlation between, between economics and, and sustainability. That's, that's still the main point, I think. Then I do realize, of course, that more the, the, the sea is, is used through other, other uses, maybe some fishing grounds might indeed be no longer as, as easily accessible, and that is, that is a reality. Um, and that there may be many problems and many solutions. I, I have to think of one, of one example that I've seen on the, in, in one of our outermost regions, actually, in one of the Région Outre-mer, in, in the Ile de, de la Réunion. Um, they have uh, done something very interesting. They, they created a, a marine protected area in, in the east of the island, um, uh, closing off you know, a large area of the, of the, of the reefs uh, to, to what had been overfishing, basically. Um, the fishermen were offered alternative means of fishing, uh, fishing more for the large pelagics, for tuna, for, for swordfish a bit further out. Um, that was made possible for them. Um, it shows two things, really. It shows that these kind of things are not only a matter of environmental protection. They are really regional politics. They are stakeholder-driven. This was a debate that has taken the whole regional government, uh, uh, and, uh, and the solution that was found was actually economically, again, it was a good solution. The fishermen could continue their, their business in a, in a slightly different way, but there was more uh, tourism, there was more uh, income from other sources, and uh, the, the net result is probably a positive one. So it shows both that these things are complex and that uh, you can make progress if you are innovative, if you are uh, involving the stakeholders, if this is a comprehensive process, and if it's something that is planned. And I think, you know, that takes us back to the notion of, of MSP. Thank you. Ida, do you agree with this? Well, 
I, I don't know if I, I should <laughs> comment on, on uh, if I agree or not on that, but what I wanted to follow up on regarding this question also was, and also what I said earlier on the on the visual journey that we are making. What I, what I see, and that's very important when it comes to fishery, of course, but also other, other activities, it's that we're now working to develop tools with cumulative assessments. Okay, we, we know more and more how we're gonna uh, bring in together, visualizing what the pressures are, what the activities are, and not at least what the values are um, economic, economically and environmentally. And this process of visualization that we're making will also uh, bring us more concretely and a better decision-making material. And then, of course, when it comes to different sectors, then it will be uh, perhaps not easier, but at least uh, a good, uh, better decision-making to see the pressures of, of uh, different sectors and um, we can make better decisions. For example, in our uh, planning process in Sweden now, we see shipping lanes and we see uh, areas where we have um, sensitive areas for birds. So when we see the pressures, we can also make better decisions. And I'm sure that is also going to, to relate to the fishery sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ida. Uh, Ashali, there was a question on, on NGOs' involvement. How did it work in the uh, Benguela Commission? How, how was, was it easy to engage uh, NGOs in, uh, in your MSP process there? Uh, NGOs? Yeah. Well, yeah, we, 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 are, we, are not, uh, we are not yet there, I think. Um, of course, the, you know, we, we are engaging uh, uh, with um, uh, 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 industry, for instance, and uh, uh, NGO, but there are not there are no, no formal structures yet uh, for engagement. If I can just uh, say something also on the on the fishery, there are, uh, in theory the Benguela Current Convention we are you know practicing ecosystem-based management, but um, that's a difficult um, um, area, uh, and we are just in the process uh, of actually doing that, but there are so many um, homeworks that we, 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 need, we need to do. Right now we have, uh, you know, serious issues related to fishing and, uh, for instance, um, um, extractive industry, the oil, uh, seismic surveys, or uh, uh, marine uh, mining and, and fisheries and so on. Uh, so there are a lot of issues that um, um, uh, we are still um, uh, not uh, yet uh, able to, to manage. But with this MSP process that has started, and when we move in, as we develop a comprehensive uh, ecosystem-based management, I think some of these issues will be addressed, but it will take time. Great, thank you very much. Let's take a, a slide or question. Uh, I like the one on the, the, the involvement of commercial sector, um, which uh, is still very short of representation in MSP process. How can we bring them on board? What's the business case for MSP? Anyone wants to address the question? Lisa? I think, I think it comes to my first comments in, in terms of why are we doing the planning? And I think it depends also how we approach the private sector, because if we approach the private sector, which is often having many times very different way of communicating, and also the terms that we use as a planning tool for bureaucracy, I think we might find some challenges in getting them on board. But we're starting to talking about the economic benefits, but also, of course, to conserve and to protect, to be able to explore and use for tourism and get all the various sectors into the room and having a discussion on, on actually why we need the spatial planning. I think that's an easier way to get them um, engaged. And I think uh, having said that, I think it's also quite crucial that the private sector is engaged early on in the spatial planning. So they're not faced to a fait accompli after the uh, government or whoever did the spatial planning um, present the solutions. And I think the business should absolutely be a part of it. 
And if I just might add, um, when we do make policy decisions, I think it's quite important for a policymaker to understand the policy makers, because the spatial plan in itself on the side of the government doesn't make any sense, it doesn't make any impact. You need to have it also in the policy making process. And having said that, you need to understand how policy maker or policy people and politicians are making decisions. So we talked yesterday about the scientific important and why is not science much more integrated in the spatial planning. And having said that, we have science and that's politicians need to make that decision, but we also need to have the economy or the economic argument as well as the polit polit political argument. And we need to understand that the trade-off that if we want to make the case for spatial planning, we cannot only use scientific argument because we're not gonna get through through the policymaker. We need to understand there's other perspectives that politicians are taking on board. And sometimes the political um, is much more stronger and we need to understand that arena. Absolutely, I think it's, it's really about articulating the benefits of MSP. We, we've said earlier that, that MSP is expensive, it's time consuming. So we need to, uh, do, to give a rationale why countries need to invest in MSP and the, in, in the benefits. That's what we want to get out of this, basically, for the environment and for economic growth. Um, okay, Any, I think we, we go maybe for a couple of more questions from, a, from the audience and then we will start thinking about wrapping up and releasing you in the world of Paris. Uh, any, any additional questions, comments? This is your last chance. Yes, Jihoon, please, from CBD. I, I cannot resist because uh, you just, uh, your last sentence about MSP is expensive and also taking a long time, but uh, I think it depends, you know, in some cases, uh, for example, we were discussing uh, over the last uh, dinner, about 20 years ago, we talked about shaman experience in Asia. And also at that time, we were doing case study on Rhode Island. So it's quite you know, uh, interesting that we see all these examples coming up at the global level, and I'm happy to see that. But within Asia, uh, learning from uh, shaman experience, it has been applied in many different local areas in Cambodia, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, in Philippines. So uh, there, I think it really depends on the scale we are talking about and also what other economic activities taking place. Uh, like the case in Cambodia where basically the beach was empty but then they, they were suffering you know, like solid waste problem in managing the beach. I think very simple uh, stakeholders environment and also participatory resource mapping could work in terms of making some very practical advancement. So I think it really depends on which area you, you are talking about and which scale and also or what type of economic activity taking place and the, the, the spectrum of stakeholders we are talking about. So it can be very simple in some cases and it can be very complicated and taking a long time. So I think we have to really, uh, I agree with uh, Lisa's point about you know, every region and also every different scale uh, requires different uh, information and also governance uh, processes. Great, thank you very much. We need to contextualize again, very important. Um, I have one question, which I think is, is also important to think about our own future as a community, is how do we really want to organize ourselves? Now, we've had this conference 10 years uh, after a, the first uh, workshop. And uh, to, to do this, maybe we, I think we can put up the, the, the poll on, on Slido. We'd like you to give us some feedback. Uh, ten years is a long time, and I think uh, we can all agree that uh, this community has reached some level of maturity. So maybe we need to, to think about a, a more regular gathering where we can continue to share those experiences at the global level. Uh, so we have different options, maybe every two years, every four years, every five years, or we go back to every ten years and we see each other in 2027. Seems like a long time. Let's see, what, what do you say? Every two years, seems to be winning. Okay. Right, Alejandro, get ready for this. <laughs> 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 
Every two years. Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's very interesting. What does our, our panel think? How, do we, how should we organize ourselves? How can we continue this momentum as a community? Any, any feedback you would like to, to, take, to give us? Yes, Lisa, please. Well, if we meet every other year, there might be something that's going on between those two years. So we don't come here for the next two years and we're starting where we just ended today. You would hope there is some progress between. And then how would we take that progress forward? Would there be a working group with IOC? I don't know. Um, and even, I think, also what we're missing out a little bit is to invite the private sector into the room. Yeah. Yeah. So, indeed, that's, a, that's, a, that's one way to go, I guess. And we can also think about more specific gatherings on more technical or governance issues related to, to MSP. Um, I, any, Bernard, are you, do you have any thoughts on, on, on this? Thank you, yes. Um, well, first of all, I think it's, 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 really, it's really good to see that there's a consensus that we should accelerate, and I think that's, that's in itself very positive. Um, we, the European Union, have, of course, you know, taken a big step with our own directive on, on, on spatial planning. Um, we, are, we are doing a lot to, to instill this notion of, of cross-border, of sea basin-based uh, spatial planning through projects. We would be very happy to engage in cross-border cooperation beyond the borders of the European Union, uh, both with our neighbors mm -hmm. and, and possibly beyond, you know, just uh, to support a process that is a, a global process because we share the oceans. and. Um, but I think you're going to come back to that afterwards. Um, in the follow-up to this event, um, we can think perhaps of setting ourselves an agenda, an ambitious agenda, an aspirational agenda, to do just that. And then I think the gatherings are uh, part of a bigger thing that, uh, that we need to take forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Any other comments? Ida, Ashali? Yes, because what, what you are doing, uh, IOC and the uh, DG Mare, uh, this is this is important, and we would like this uh, to, to 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 continue. Yes, we we want to do uh, you know to move the process on through doing, but of course um, sharing uh, experiences and best practices are, uh, are extremely important. Uh, a number of case studies uh, were presented here. Hope they will be made available to your website and so on. They, these are very important uh, lessons that we can draw and then move on. Okay, so continue to keep documenting the practice of MSP. That's important. Okay, this is now your last chance to give uh, one key priority that we need to, to take forward from, uh, from this meeting onwards. You have all about 45 seconds each, and I'll start with you, Mr. Monsieur Bouvier. Une recommandation. La responsabilité majeure des États dans la construction de la planification spatiale est de façon un peu contradictoire la nécessité de réfléchir et de travailler dans un cadre supraétatique. Et puis je poserai juste une question. Je suis encore dans mon temps de parole. Une question un peu provocatrice. Jusqu'où veut-on aller dans l'exercice de planification spatiale Faut-il planifier l'intégralité de l'espace maritime, construire une espèce de cadastre maritime à l'échelle mondiale Ou faut-il se focaliser plutôt sur les zones les plus sensibles où les usages sont les plus divers et les plus conflictuels et définir des zones de vocation C'est une question majeure. Elle n'est pas, pas théorique. Elle est très pratique. Elle est d'actualité puisque vous savez que l'ONU et l'Organisation des Nations Unies est engagée et engage les États dans une négociation sur l'application de la Convention montego Bay en haute mer, et notamment dans une logique de protection de la biodiversité en haute mer. Donc cette question que je pose, jusqu'où veut-on aller dans la planification spatiale Jusqu'où jusqu veut-on conserver la liberté de l'usage maritime C'est une question majeure pour demain, et je crois que ça permettra de prolonger la réflexion. Thank you very much. Lisa 
As spatial planning is involving so many various different actors in sectors, in private sector, in governments, in regional governments, and cities, it's really about finding the trade-offs and, and seeing the overall picture. So finding a win-win situation. Um, and having said that, I think my last point is to say that ABBA actually did not have right. It's not about winner takes it all. It's really about finding this collaborative and a win-win situation where everyone see the benefits of collaborating. Great, thank you. Bernard. Okay, um, I'd like to take the point that Mr. Bouvier made. Um, indeed, I think we are not, we're not looking at something that should or can evolve into a comprehensive top-down uh, planning uh, exercise. I think what, what we're in here is, a, is an open process. And so the one takeaway I would I would I would say we should we should uh, we should have here is is to be to be open to stakeholders, open to all the interests, find a balance between the interests, and and have an have a process of, of spatial planning that is that is open to stakeholders that that seeks to find uh, an equilibrium between those interests that are business interests and they need to be represented, and and those interests that are perhaps not so much defended by someone but need to be defended as well. I think that's the beauty of the, of the approach that we can develop, that we have been developing already in some areas, and I think that's, for me, a very important element to take it forward. Right. Thank you. Ashali? Uh, yes. Uh, for me, uh, always uh, number one, uh, what has been mentioned here, uh, stakeholders' uh, engagement is, is very, very important, extremely important for this process. You know, you build trust and, um, you know, there are so many uh, who have stake in the ocean and um, excluding them uh, is a, a recipe for fa failing to implement the, the, the process. Thank you. Ida. Well, a takeaway home. Um, tell what you experienced here to your colleagues at home and not only in your nearby group but to the broader organization. I think that's really being part of the storytelling that this MSP, Marine Spatial Planning and Area-Based Management, is really an important tool for broader uh, work. And then, of course, as since I work with the preparations of the UN conference in June on Agenda 2030, um, I would like um, that MSP is a part of the storytelling and the uh, work to, to implement this agenda. So I encourage you to, to follow the work of um, um, Agenda 2030 and the June conference online when you come back home and that we continue our network to grow within that context also and the work after that. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Ida. And on that note, actually, I also want to, to, to inform our, our audience that uh, together with the European Commission, we are planning to, to take forward and take the, the outcome of this conference to the New York uh, meeting. Uh, first in registering a voluntary commitment together with the European Commission on promoting international uh, MSP at the international level. And also in, in organizing a possibly a, a side event during the conference uh, where we can really present some of the outcome and what we're going to do in the next years uh, together. And of course with all our partners. So this will be, a, for those of you who will be in New York, please, please keep this in mind. So let me uh, thank you very much. Please, a, a round of applause for, to our excellent panel. And before we actually uh, go into the closing remarks from the, the two organizing uh, um, uh, partners, uh, let me also highlight a couple of points because I think some, some of you have asked questions how do we access this richness of information that was exchanged uh, during the, those three days? I mean, first of all, we have a website and in there we will uh, post the uh, presentations uh, with the agreement of uh, the presenters. Uh, so this will be uh, widely accessible on the web. Um, we will have also a report of this conference and this will be prepared in the coming weeks uh, and, and will be released uh, in a couple of months, hopefully from now. 
uh, again. And of course, we will also have a, a special issue of uh, marine policy. And, and, and Charles Hiller, who is continue to, to document this, this uh, national practices around the world has, uh, has managed to secure us a, a special issue uh, in the coming months and he will be the lead editor for that and uh, so we will of course invite uh, some of it, not, we cannot invite all presenters but we will invite some presenters to, to, to write papers for this uh, special issue so please stay tuned on this. And with this um, I will now uh, would like to invite uh, Bernard Fries to give us a closing remark and information about the roadmap uh, that we've talked about uh, at the beginning uh, of this uh, of this conference. Bernard, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Julian, and um, thank you again for that really, really uh, productive discussion. And um, before I say anything about the roadmap, I would just like to thank you and. Uh, the uh, UNESCO very, very warmly for, uh, for having organized this event with us. And uh, I think it's been a great cooperation. Uh, we are very, very grateful. I think it's been a very, a, very good, uh, a very good event. It's been a very good site. You have been very hospitable. We had beautiful weather. You know, what, what would you like to have more? Um, and, and the quality of the discussions was really, I found, excellent and, and really, really uh, constructive. Um, I'm not going to give you a long, a long, a long speech because I think we, we have been talking a lot and uh, we all have to absorb what, what, has, been, what has been said. I'd, I'd just like to say that for me there are sort of three, three key notions that come to mind. The first one is positive. I've sensed a very positive uh, atmosphere here, a very positive spirit, a lot of engagement. I think that is really something we can, we can build on. It's really good, I think, really, really uh, encouraging. Uh, the second notion I, I, that comes to mind is, is progress. We have made, I think, so much progress since you mentioned the first event 10 years ago. And we have made progress everywhere, actually. And, and again, really, you, you could sense that today and, and during these three days. And it's, it's something very good, I think. Um, and the third element, of course, is, is that this is also a political thing. Um, we need to give a political impulse to, to what we're doing here because it's important, it's important for, uh, for our oceans, it's important for our globe, for, our, for, our, um, for, the, for the world as, as, as a whole, it's important for our environment. Um, we, we need to have a, a, a political impulse, we need to, to move forward. Um, we have agreed that we'll sit together after this event to, to come to what could be a, a joint roadmap that, that can set out an agenda to take us forward. Um, we think that could be a, a good way, a good way to, to make sure that we actually follow up on all the important and, and useful and constructive things that we have been discussing in, this, in these three days. And so we were thinking of, of structuring it along uh, five, five priority areas. I'll go very quickly through them and then I think we, we think about that and we try to pin down very concrete actions. The first one is transboundary maritime spatial planning. So really seeing how we can reinforce through concrete actions this, this notion of, of cross-border planning. The second one is the, is the blue economy and, and that in combination with the Agenda 2030. Uh, and uh, you know, how, can we, how can we make sure that spatial planning serves also economic development in a sustainable way. Um, the third notion is ecosystem-based spatial planning. And, and I think we all agree after these days that an ecosystem approach needs to be the baseline for, for, for going forward, for anything we, we are going to do going forward. Um, the fourth area, and we have heard about it today, is, is capacity building, and that goes across a range of things from, from institutional capacity building to, to indeed education, training, qualifications. And, and the, the fifth area is, is mutual understanding and communication, communicating about the importance of, of what we're doing here. Uh, and we, and that's the last thing I'm going to say, we, the European Commission, we would be happy to engage on, 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 these, on these five areas with you, with all of you. In the end, someone, someone said today that, uh, um, who, someone asked the question there, who is in the lead, and someone answered, well, it's, it's the countries who are in the lead, it's everybody who's in the lead. I think, th I think that is right. 
So this is, this is an agenda that we can try to formulate and take forward if we do it in, in a common way. Um, we have been gathering some experiences in the European Union. We would be very happy to help. I know sometimes it's a bit scary if someone from Europe stands here and says, we're going to come and help you. But I can tell you that this is a very serious proposition. Um, we are very, very confident that this can take us somewhere, somewhere good. And so I'd like to thank you again, basically. I'd thank to, like to thank our, our co-hosts. I'd like to thank our hosts here. And I'd like to thank all of you for the energy and the, the creativity and the uh, contributions you have to put into this event. So thank you very much, and I wish you a very good journey back. Thank you very much, Bernard, and I guess I, I get to say the last words. So again, also very pleased to have had this uh, long-standing uh, collaboration with the European Commission in organizing this, this conference. I mean, the, I think for, for the IOC and UNESCO staff, it's been a real pleasure to have you all here in Paris uh, in, in those last few days. And we want to, to, re to continue to commit to, to marine spatial planning, and the IOC will do that uh, by continuing to act as a, as a, as a hub for documenting um, MSP practice and, and, and knowledge. I think we will also work on, on trying to build stronger empirical evidence of the uh, benefits of MSP uh, for, 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 for economy, for blue growth, uh, for environmental stewardship. Uh, we'll focus also our work on SDGs because uh, IOC has a, a, a role to play in the SDG 14, particularly in terms of a, a custodian agency for aspects related to, to ocean acidification and science and, and technology and capacity development. Um, we will work on communication for decision makers, including through the concepts of ocean literacy. This is some, some area where, where we are really engaging now, and I think we, we, used to, we need to use this approach to support the MSP implementation. We need to continue to build the science base and the knowledge base for marine spatial planning through, through science, through uh, data systems, and observations that can really support the implementation at the national level. And to do that, this is also why the IOC is calling for an international uh, or UN uh, decade, in fact, uh, for ocean science uh, for sustainable development. And, and we'll propose this at the June conference to really try to create a strong synergies and, and, and better integration of scientific work to, to deliver on sustainable development. We'll, of course, continue the working and keeping the website alive in the, in the coming years. Uh, Bernard has mentioned the, 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 the roadmap, and we have a number of activities in there, in particular the development of, uh, of uh, cross-border or transnational uh, MSP guidelines. And of course, we will continue to work on capacity development. This is one of the core area uh, for IUC. So we will, we will do that through our regional programs and through our specific capacity development uh, uh, training uh, mechanisms. So with this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the only thing to do now is to say thank you. We want to thank all of you for being such active participants uh, in these uh, three days. We really hope you enjoyed this. Um, we hope to see you very soon. We want to thank our sponsors, the Government of Flanders, uh, Suez, our main supporters also who, who played an active role here in bringing people, the GIS, G, GIZ, the Weight Institute, the Moore Foundation. We want to thank all the facilitators, the speakers, the reporters, of course the European Commission, DG Mare staff, the EASM staff, the Mare contractors, and particularly the QED team who was with us all this week and, and really helped us with the, the organizational aspects, NIRAS for the, the, the excellent work and, and the, the case studies that, that really enriched this conference. I want to personally thank Bud Hiller, uh, who I've been working with for the last uh, long time, 12 years, I guess, uh, on MSP. And, and, and Bud is, is, as you know, a, a, a committed to continue this, this work, even though he says he will retire soon, but I don't believe him. I want also to, uh, to thank uh, UNESCO colleagues here who worked very hard in getting this room ready uh, on time for this meeting. And that was uh, quite a challenge, I can tell you, but uh, uh, hopefully you are happy with the end result. I want to thank the, the interpreters uh, for helping us to better understand each other in, in creating this, 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 uh, this bond. And to thank the firemen for keeping us safe, as always. 
I want to thank the, 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 the te technical uh, people in charge of the sound and, and lightning, and of course uh, the, the people who've helped us with the exhibitions, um, and of course all of the IOC uh, staff who uh, engage in this conference. And I know I shouldn't do this, and you will probably have a go at me for doing it, but I want to thank two particular people, because they are men and women behind institutions, and I want to highlight those two persons, and those are basically Marie Colombier from the European Commission and Alejandro Iglesias, who have worked <laughs> extensively in the last year and a half in getting you here. And uh, if we have a success, success today, it's also partly because of them. So with this, thank you very much. Safe trip, bon voyage, et à très bientôt. Goodbye.